In 1988, a woman by the name Dorothy Richmond had become very ill and bedridden due to her cancer. Her husband, 55-year-old John Jamelski, was heartbroken. But not for his wife, no. He was worried about his sex life. You see, Dorothy's illness made it impossible for her to have sex. So John came up with a plan, an evil plan, that worked out for him for way too long. This is the story of John Jamelski, the Dungeon Master. John wasn't going to just sit by and let a little cancer get in the way of him getting his needs met. So he decided to build a dungeon, a sex dungeon, where he could do whatever he wanted to whoever he wanted. He would start work on this project in his basement, where he was able to dig out an 8 foot long tunnel into one of the walls. This tunnel was small and had to be traversed on hands and knees. At the end of this small tunnel was a steel door. Opening this steel door would reveal a room that was 24 feet long and 12 feet wide. The ceiling was 8 feet high, with the opening with the steel door being almost to the ceiling. To get down from that small opening, there was a small three-rung ladder. Still in 1988, John would kidnap his first victim, a 14-year-old Native American girl. She was initially put in a small well behind John's mother's house, but when the dungeon construction was complete, she was transported there. She was sexually assaulted nearly every day. She would be restrained with a chain that was connected to an ankle bracelet. Her toilet was a metal chair with the seat part removed and placed over a bucket. She would be bathed in a bathtub with a garden hose. Of course, the bathtub didn't have plumbing, so the water would just sit there until it eventually evaporated. This would create damp and moldy conditions in the basement, which in itself is a hazard to live in. But that was obviously the least of the girl's worries. You might be surprised at what I'm about to say. I know that I was surprised. But after two years of captivity, John would just bring his victim, who was now 17, to her home. I would love to end the story here and say he dropped her off at home. She went to the authorities. They find him and they arrest him. But this is not how this story goes, unfortunately. It's not even close. And we've barely even scratched the surface. The girl never went to the police. While in captivity, John would convince her that he was part of a large crime ring and that he was also part of the sheriff's department, even showing her a fake badge he had found years prior. He would also say that he was just following orders from his bosses and that the easier the daily sexual assaults went, the sooner she could be let out. So the girl never went to the authorities because she was terrified. Five years would go by without another kidnapping, Dorothy's health, continued to decline, and John decided it was time to strike again. Before we go any further, I just want to say thank you for watching, and if you're enjoying the story, well, I, I mean the video so far, I'd really appreciate it if you could hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this one. It'd really help me out. If not, thanks anyways just for watching. I'll shut the hell up and let's just get back to the story. In 1995, John would kidnap another 14-year-old girl. This time, it was a Latina runaway. He would lure her to his dungeon under the guise that he had a job for her, where she could deliver a package and get paid for it. Once she was in the bunker, she was trapped and had to live under the same conditions of the first victim. Being a runaway, her family never reported her kidnapping. She was trapped for two years before John would drop her off at her mother's apartment. Now, despite John threatening her family with all that fake shit I was telling you about earlier, about how he's part of a slave ring and he's part of the sheriff's department, this girl would still go to the authorities. But because of the girl's previous drug use, they didn't think she was credible, so they didn't investigate. That same year, 1997, John would take his third victim right off of the street. She was a 53-year-old Vietnamese woman. What a turn, right? I know. Two 14-year-olds and now a 53-year-old. I'll tell you the reasoning for the huge difference in a bit. After abducting her, he would drive her to an abandoned house where he would sexually assault her. Following the initial assault, he would take her to his house where she would suffer daily assaults just like the others. I'll mention now that each of these victims were made to keep up on a calendar and actually had to fill in each day when they were sexually assaulted, took a bath, or had their teeth brushed. I don't know why they had to do this besides John being a complete fucking psycho, 
The woman was held in the dungeon for a little less than a year before John would drop her off at a bus station with $50. The woman would report what happened to the police the same day. The police were informed of what John was doing, his kidnapping, the dungeon, the daily sexual assaults, and the police would finally investigate John. Sergeant Thomas Connellan of the Syracuse Police Department stated that they investigated the lead, and it didn't pan out. The woman would say it didn't pan out because the police just straight up didn't believe her. So the nightmare continues. John takes a little break between the last victim and the next, probably due to his wife passing away in 1999, but maybe not. He seems pretty heartless, so I wonder if he even cared. So we move forward to 2001. John would offer a ride home to a 26-year-old white woman. Apparently the weather was bad that day, so she accepted the offer. I'm sure you know where the story goes from here, to the dungeon. So she's dealing with the same things the previous girls had to deal with, except for this time, she was resisting John's sexual assaults. And when she would resist his assaults, he would take a lit cigar and burn her. She actually ended up developing an abscess on her lower back from it. The woman would eventually talk John into letting her write home, so that she could let her parents know that she was alive. In the letter, she would state that she's alive and well, but in a drug rehab clinic, which prompted the police to close her case as a missing person. She was eventually released by John like the others, and she would go to the police. And this time, the police actually put in the, the tiniest bit of effort. With the police already not believing her because of the letter she had written, it didn't help when the sexual assault kit came back showing no signs of abuse. The reason it came back showing no signs of abuse was that John would stop the assaults days before he let her go. But she did remember what kind of car John drove and told the police. She told the police a tan 1974 Mercury Comet, which there was one in the area, but it didn't belong to John. So they closed the case. Had the police searched for more than just the 1974 model, like, say, the 1975 model, they would have found John because he drove a 1975 tan Mercury Comet, which shared the same body style of the 1974 model. The police continue to fail these women, but not for long. In October of 2002, John would kidnap an African-American runaway. Remember when I said earlier that there's a reason between the age gaps and the race differences of these women and girls? Well, it turns out John was a collector. Well, he was more of a hoarder. His house was just filled with bullshit. It is believed that John was taking all these different races and ages and in his head creating a collection of victims. So, again, in 2002, John would kidnap an African-American runaway who, of course, would suffer through the same torture of the previous girls. But she had either gained his trust or he was just getting bolder because he would take her out to a karaoke bar, where she would play along. Happy with this successful outing, John would take her out once more. This time, the girl would slip away from him for a few moments, and she was actually able to reach a phone and call her sister to tell her everything that had been going on. Then she hung up abruptly so that John wouldn't catch her on the phone. After the girl had returned to John, her sister, who she had just called, had called the number back via caller ID. When an employee of the bottling company that they were at, see he's taking more of his collection to the bottle company, she filled her in on the story. The boss of the company was able to get a hold of the police and John was finally tracked down and arrested. It's been said that John didn't know that what he did was bad. He's an idiot. It took his lawyers multiple days to drill into his head that forcibly taking women and putting them in a dungeon is actually kidnapping. This dude really thought he was going to spend, at most, a couple days in jail, maybe a fine, do some community service. This guy's insane. I'm not even going to look into or give an update on how the women are doing now. I didn't even give their names, because they don't want to be associated with the case at all, and I don't blame them. John pleaded guilty to the five kidnapping charges and received 18 years to life in prison. He has already had a few parole hearings, and thankfully, he's still behind bars. Let's hope it stays that way.